Okay, so uh, I'm Scott Murray. No <coughs> bunch of you folks. Um, so just I've been a Linux user a long time, doing open embedded and Yocto for, I don't know, five, six years at least now. Work with Consulco Group, which uh, is a embedded Linux consulting company. Um, and so uh, it's a quick agenda. So I'm very briefly talk about containers because Bruce has you know kind of covered up off, covered all the high level stuff I would normally talk about, um, and then very quickly also skim over the OE sort of advantages. Um, I'm going to make this slide deck available, so if you want to dig through all the details, um, you can. And then I'm going to jump into the, some of the example configurations, which Bruce sort of stole a little bit of my thunder by putting up that uh, <laughs> container uh, sort of template. And then if I'm not running totally drastically over time, I'll try and get through some of the multi-config stuff. Um, so if you had seen my talk in Ed Edinburgh at ELC 2018, uh, this is an evolution of that. So there is some stuff that is the same and there's some tweaks to it. Uh, and also it's a little bit ver verbatim. I have tweaked a few things from uh, Dev Day in San Diego. Uh, I am still not a container expert, uh, so if you have a really like intense Docker question, I am not going to have any idea. But um, as well, things are moving along. Um, uh, Bruce did mention Podman, but that's a thing now. I think is starting to be a bit more interesting potentially for some of our use cases. It is in meta virtualization, but I, I haven't really looked at it yet. But I have been starting to think about maybe trying to use it. Um, and so I think we're good with this audience with the level. And so Kuhn isn't here, but I was going to throw in here that uh, I do mention Pocky in a few spots. Um, uh, but you can do, do all this stuff with OE Core, yeah, basically. Um, so Bruce kind of covered all this stuff and he even mentioned uh, Kata containers. So, <laughs> uh, But one of the things to note is um, so you can either do a full system uh, container with a full install uh, distro, or you can do an app container. So um, it's kind of the two use cases. Um, and then, so for both of them, it's sandboxing is what we kind of think of, and uh, you know, microservices like Bruce mentioned. Um, and the typical way is you would prune down a distro, and Alpine, as Bruce mentioned, is a very common thing you'll see in people using containers. Uh, um, so quick drawbacks, reproducibility, which is where we talk about OE, it's got, gives us reproducibility. Um, and one of the things is that, you know, Docker Hub, you don't necessarily know if you just say, someone says, oh, I need you to run this thing, just go to Docker Hub and Docker install this image. I mean, you have no idea, right? Like, unless you're actually going to sit down and do forensic analysis. So there's a lot of trust there, which if you're paranoid, <laughs> it might be difficult to actually be happy with. Um, uh, and so license compliance, I mean, this is a big part of the you know, open embedded story is we have, you know, built in tools for license compliance and things like that. If you're in a situation, which a lot of people doing cloud services aren't necessarily too concerned about it, but you might be in a situation where you're going to sell your company for, you know, to a bunch of you know, venture capitalists or something, and they want to do a bunch of due diligence, and they're like, well, the software that's on your cloud service, do you know what it is? And you're like, no. <laughs> so this is where you can actually, you know, if you're actually building these containers yourselves, you, you actually have a good idea. Um, and customization, of course. Um, so I've sort of already been touching on this. So I mean, OE is, gives you the reproducibility, um, and you know, you know, you're in control of everything. You're bootstrapping your builds. Um, the uh, support thing is where maybe with cloud stuff isn't as important as a pure embedded system. Uh, where the, you know, right now. The LTS story is starting to come together a bit more for open embedded, but at the moment you're still on this like 12 to 14 months and then you have to be prepared to do upgrades or maintenance. Um, but we do have, like I said, tooling for licensed manifests and archiving and source archiving. And as well, you can support hardware architectures that a typical container 
you know, that like other distros might not support. So if you want to do containers on MIPS, you can with Open Embedded, which as is not necessarily a slam dunk with other distros. Um, but then you get into things like if in your container you want to do certain types of things with Python or Node.js, those kinds of things are harder potentially with an OE-based solution because we don't have the breadth of packages that something like Debian would have. Um, so there's some numbers there if you wanted, you know, the, this, some of this is similar to the other times I've given this presentation, so I'll kind of skip over that. And of course, I don't think anybody in this room is probably particularly new to OE, but if we were, you know, pitching this to the general container, you know, cloud services folks, I mean, OE is a new tool set to learn, right? So this is the thing that Philip would like us to go to other conferences and get people on board. I think it's still the case that it, you know, I was at the booth for OE uh, the last couple of days. People say, how hard is it to do? How hard is it to get started on this? And we, I mean, Doctor Project has a lot of docs and, you know, thank, thanks to Scott Riffenbark. But our onboarding is still probably a bit harder than it, you know, probably can be. I think we could maybe come up with better examples for some of these things. Um, but, uh, so there's definitely more work there, I think. Um, so, getting closer to the nitty gritty here. So, as Bruce has mentioned, uh, uh, there's been a container support basically since Pyro, um, uh, which basically built, you build an image that's just a pure tarball and no kernel components at all. So this is basically what you would essentially get in a, for a container. And Metavert provides all the extra tooling, um, has it, the OCI tools that Bruce was mentioning, uh, and since Warrior, I believe, is I think what I've worked out. Um, and as well, if you're doing different things with the Metavert virtualization, this kernel configuration fragment's in there to turn on support for different things. Um, as Bruce kind of was talking about, we can't really directly just build a Docker image. We're closer now with OCI. We can build an OCI image and you can get upload that into Docker very straightforwardly like Bruce was showing. Um, but to actually like, build a Docker image and actually like get it in target and stuff like that, that's more difficult because Docker needs its daemon. Um, and that's one of those, the arguments the cloud folks have about daemon and versus not. Use Vue though. Uh, well, that's a, one of these new things that I have not investigated it yet. <laughs> that is why build it exists, right? Is they want to be able to do it and not have to run cloud. You can basically, you can use the same uh, Docker, Docker file, file, yeah. Pass it to build that, you will get a container and you can push yes. it to register, to Docker the register. Right. So they're, we're getting there, right? That's, I have not, it's on my to-do list to investigate doing that. Um, so as well, Beth uh, is going to talk probably about Oryx <coughs> this afternoon, I believe. So this is, oh, they have a, a turnkey solution for doing stuff with Run C. Um, so that's another option. Uh, so. It would be nice to actually know, you know, what, what's it take to actually configure and build? I mean, Bruce showed that uh, BB file. Uh, I'm just going to walk through a few examples here um, of different configs. So if you want to experiment and just try the container uh, image type, you just basically uh, could throw in local.conf, you can just set image FS types to container. It needs to have the dummy kernel turned on. And uh, so this is an example of trying to basically do the builder <coughs> image that is used on the auto builders is to try and build an equivalent container of that. Um, and so this package groups, basically, there's a package group self-hosted, which is a, a more comprehensive set of packages, but to just actually be able to build OE, like bootstrap yourself, you just need the SDK and the hosted extended. Um, and so if you put these in and you do a build with this local.conf, you get a relatively small image, uh, like 500 megabytes decompressed. Um, you do get some graphics bits pulled in because the, the builder images that they do actually have a bit of graphical desktop stuff for remote admin, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have been trying to decipher why it doesn't look like a couple things should be pulled in that are pulled in, and I'm still trying to un work out the dependencies. It's not proving not obvious right off. Um, 
You can tweak the distro features actually to make it even smaller. Um, cut out a few things that would get pulled in by default by the package group core, uh, package group base uh, package group. Um, but one of the things to note, and I'm, this is kind of the case, it would be nice to have a switch to try and tweak some of this is the, our volatile directories support basically relies on post install scripts. Uh, and so when you're using a container, unless you're going to do, you know, Docker and actually Docker file it, um, you basically aren't going to have those in the tarball, right? So you have to worry about actually making sure that the volatile directories get created. Um, and if you're using this container, like building something like this, and you're going to actually use it for builds, you have to do the like build user and, and manage the directory trees for your source trees. Um, so this is a little simple, actually writing this up as a, a container definition, a little image. Um, and basically I have a hook here to do the, actually stick in the volatile directories in the, the root of S. So let's see how I can do it here. All right, so that's kind of a very simple example. Um, there's a little tweak you could do if you don't want to always have to, you know, play around and actually set the, the dummy kernel and things like that. And you can do a little bit of pruning by turning off some of the host uh, or the, like the machine bits like V86D and stuff like that for Intel get pulled in by the machine essential uh, extra R depends. If you clear that, then you lose a few things that you're not actually going to need in the container image. Um, so that's one thing you can just stick this uh, machine definition in and then use that. Um, I'll mention later, there are interesting things when you start doing multi-config, you have to be cognizant of the names of things to make sure that your dependencies will work. But so that's, that's sort of the very basic, if I was wanting to start building containers so I could automate my CI and actually not have to worry about taking a Debian, Debian image and doing build essentials and stuff. If I want to say, well, I already have a working open embedded build and build containers that I can bootstrap myself. It's something like that. So Alpine is the sort of prototypical thing that people tend to want to use in uh, you know, cloud stuff because it's, you know, it's like Debian, but it's all, it's tiny because it's built with muscle. Um, it has other wrinkles. They went and built their own package management from scratch and stuff like that. So it's, <laughs> it's not necessarily the, uh, as obvious as you'd think sometimes, but so if we were going to say, well, let, I mean, we can build with, you know, muscle. I mean, Chem's done a great job of, you know, getting open embedded supporting that. Let's try and build an Alpine like distro. Uh, and this is also very simple to do. I mean, you just turn on muscle and we do the same. We're just going to set the container image type and dummy kernel and you get this. So this is core image minimal. Basically, um, this is the package list. It's about a little bit under five megabytes. It has been pretty stable over the last few releases because I mean, it's busy box. So we're not actually adding too much and muscle is been pretty good. glibc has a bit of a slight growth problem over the last like five years. I think we've gone, you know, the, the minimum core image minimal has gone up by like 50 or 100 megs or something like that. But the uh, if you actually were to do the kind of thing like Alpine do, they have their tiny package manager they built. If we used O package, you add like another like eight or nine megs, um, which is still somewhat comparable to uh, Alpine if you just do the minimal Alpine image. Um, but if you want to use RPM or DNF, you bloat the image quite a bit. Merrick wants to ask a question. <laughs> Can you compile out the package management out of the image completely? Uh, yes. If you want, like, update alternatives, is that what you mean? That's one of the things. That's without, uh, <clears throat> so I'm not setting the package management uh, image feature. I mean, it's not like going to generate packages at all after that. Oh uh, no, well, well, I mean, you, it's open a better, it, packages get made to be build the root FS, uh -huh. but there is no package manager in the image. So can you like skip this stuff because it adds to a build time? No. No, I don't believe so. The tar.gz uh, doesn't actually work. You can't set that as the package manager type. Okay. As far as I know, I, I tried it a long time ago and it didn't work, but. What about opt? It goes, it just. It, I, 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 it, 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 it is in there. I, I haven't tried building it recently. Um, 
Sure, RPM doesn't much more add much because it's leave DB and binaries. Well, you need will add the whole, fetch the whole you need, Python stuff. You need Python. Not for RPM. Uh, you used you to. Know. You used to need it. Okay. Yeah. But so that's why it's a hundred megs of stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I have I don't have it on this slides. I have given a presentation a couple of years ago on image slides and app was like twenty five megs or something like that. Yeah, it's, still, it's still bigger. It's still hard to beat OPG. Yes. Um, and I assume that's why the Alpine guys wrote their own, is they want it, but they their thing is their metadata is very small, same as O package, but I think they built their own solver. They don't use one of the libraries. Um, so you can also do other tweaks, update alternatives. If you're actually really concerned about size, there's like a few hundred K from the update alternative stuff. Uh, you can kind of prune that out. Um, and so uh, I kind of drafted this sort of, here's a distro config and my apologies for using Pocky as the starting point. Um, and basically baking this stuff in, having a, a really cut down distro features um, these days, if you don't want to have the warning that Bruce put in for meta virtualization, you need to put virtualization in the distro features or you'll see it every time you run BitBake. Um, but this basically prunes out as much as you can reasonably do and still have some knobs that people can also tweak later on. Um, so that's basically, if you take a distro config like this and throw it in and just, you know, use the container image type you're in the ballpark of Alpine, um, but then you're you know you're in control. You can add whatever packages you want on top. Different here. Don't want to keep us from lunch. <laughs> uh, so that's the distro we're doing. That's an at like an actual full system install, uh, and then we could add more things on top. Um, what about an application container? So if we want to just build one app in a container. This is sort of basically the template that Bruce showed. This is because he, he basically took what I showed in Edinburgh and put it in meta virtualization. So this basically builds a, an extremely minimal image. We drop almost everything except the directory structure, uh, which is what base files gives you. And uh, I think NetBase creates some of the device nodes basically. So you know that there's enough stuff there that actually apps will run. Um, and then we do we do still tweak the uh, the directories the volatile ones, and so we clear out all language support and we actually set the force up read only remove flag, uh, which drops the update alternative stuff. And so for something like a web server like Light HTTPD, which in most systems you're not going to necessarily be too concerned about it because it's such a small web server and, it, and it's heavily used. But if you're really paranoid and you're like, I want to stick that in a, you know, a container um, and actually either host it or use it on a, an embedded target, if you do a, take that container uh, image, uh, which I think is container base would give you the OCI <laughs> one that Bruce has tweaked, um, and you just basically stick in you know, the, the actual application as the image install. Um, and I'll explain why BusyBox is in here. But, the uh, you basically get an image that just has that application package and its dependencies, um, and so and so because Muscle gets pulled in, of course, it's the C library, um, and so here's a similar one with NGINX, which would be maybe something a bit bigger that you might be a bit more concerned about as you know getting in a system. Um, so you might see from our depends that Fash gets pulled in which has a bit of a chain reaction sometimes you'll get more stuff um, but if an application actually ever does a uh, like system or a, a fork in an exec you need to have sh so that's why you have to have busy box in sometimes and because light http tbd has a couple spots where it does a fork you have to have busy box in um, and of course, also there's no post and solve script support. So if you're using a recipe for something that actually has its explicit post install, you'll have to be worried about that. Um, and so like, a, you know, Bruce pointed out and I've been saying, there's actually, 
a version of this in uh, meta virtualization now that does OCI images. Um, and so if you were going to do these types of things and actually just build images with the goal of sticking them in either your own Docker Hub or up on you know full Docker Hub, um, definitely use what's in meta virtualization as your starting point. And the documentation's there and was in Bruce's slides of how you just upload stuff. Um, but with these types of, of actual recipes, you can build an app, you know, container very straightforwardly. And they're quite small. I mean, if you want to do Alpine-ish things in this type of scenario where it's just the application, these, you know, container images are just the container and its dependencies. And it's very transparent. You know what's in there and you could, you know, look at all the source very easily. So it's a little, little more straightforward than some of the stuff you'd have to do with like uh, Debian or Ubuntu or even Alpine. So I'm not doing too bad, I think. I just ask a question. Yes, yep. Um, is, it, is it possible to kind of throw out BusyBox and, and grab SH from somewhere? Or you, you, yeah, you are could. Are BusyBox with just SH support? What would you say? Yes, you could um, tweak the BusyBox config to basically drop all the other applets. Would it be worth doing? Would that get you down quite sizably? No, not the BusyBox is not that big. It's You might you might gain back like... The meg? Sort of yeah, thing. it might be in meg. Um, is kind of the benefit of BusyBox, but if you were really want, if you want to constrain how much yeah. attack surface was there, yeah. Yeah. you could you slap in a, a def yeah. config for BusyBox. It just basically builds SH. Um, or if you're less concerned, you could build full glibc with full bash, right? But I'd, I'd yeah. be really keen to get rid of anything in a container. That yeah, exactly. Be there, yeah. <laughs> Which is a lot easier with this than it is to try and work out how to go rebuild packages for Alpine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Merrick? Hey, isn't it better to just use config fragments for the busy books? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. You, you, you could, but the thing is, if you're turning everything off, yeah. you might as well just use a full config that just is all on set, right? But You'd have to work out what was easier. So I'm almost through my half hour, I guess. But so I'll very quickly give the first few slides about multi-config, and then I'll, if you want to have questions about the examples, they are a bit different than what I showed in Edinburgh. So um, we're not particularly pressed for time. Okay. Since we're not. All right. So we have a long lunch break, and we're not okay. trying to fit slots exactly. Okay. Um, so. Multi-config is hopefully a little more visible now. It was added a couple of releases ago in uh, OE, maybe almost like what, two years or something like that. Um, in early days, it wasn't particularly obvious from the documentation how useful it would be, but I think now it's quite recognized. Um, so this allows you to build multiple images or packages for different targets where <coughs> each configuration can have you know, either different distro features, a different machine, uh, and basically do invoke BitBake once and, and build all these things. So there's a link there to the docs. This is probably going to be, <laughs> I missed that last night. Uh, it should be latest probably. Um, and so how can we use this? We can, you know, build multiple images with differences. Uh, and then potentially we could do nesting, which is Bruce briefly mentioned is actually do actually cross build dependencies between these different configurations and, and merge things together. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to configure. There's a multi config variable that lists the configurations that you would put in local.conf. Each of these multi configs uh, basically goes in a directory that would normally be in, in conf, and you populate, populate it with each uh, configuration has its own config file. So in this, when we said AB here, A.conf can just set the machine type and B could set, you know, ARM or do something else. Um, but one of the things back when I presented on this previously um, wasn't obvious at the time, but it was mentioned in the release notes for uh, Zeus, I think. Richard realized that actually the multi-config directory, because of the way the parsing works, can actually be anywhere as I think BB path. So um, if you have a layer, you can actually put a multi-config directory in the layers conf and then put multi-configuration configurations in the layer so you can carry it around with the layer, which is potentially quite handy actually. 
Um, somebody like Xilinx, you could imagine, could put a multi-config directory in their layer and then have it that they can document. If you want to build a config for, you know, a multiple, like a complicated thing with an FPGA image, they could kind of document that. And so for building these, you basically say bitbake, multi-config, colon, config, colon, target, uh, which is more complicated. Uh, Richard shortened it to MC, uh, or I think he took a pack from somebody to shorten it to MC for Zeus. Uh, I think it still supports multi-config, but you can just type MC. Um, one of the things to be aware of is um, a lot of the types of things you might want to do will need different tempters for the different configurations. Um, if the C library and the machine are the same, you sh should be able to get away with the same tempter and the state cache will be all happy. Um, but actually, I was supposed to take this out. So Joshua has told me that the state cache does work between the, the configurations now. It's not immediately obvious to me. I haven't dug into it that if it's 100% reuse, it's not clear. Um, but this is supposed to be better now. I think the docs still say it isn't shared, but it. I've been told that it's working better than now. Um, the uh, one other thing you'll see if you if you use multi config is you'll see multiple blocks of bit big startup when you run the commands, um, and basically a, a separate bit big engine is sort of run for each configuration. Uh, one thing to note though is if you do what I showed in the previous slide with uh, multi config equals a b, you'll actually see three bit bigs because there's also like one main one that's actually for the configuration that's in local.conf. So if you're only doing two, <laughs> uh, two configurations, uh, it's, it's handy just to say uh, multi-config equals A, and then you would have the configuration that's in local.conf would be sort of the host one, and then whatever you have in multi-config would be the sort of secondary one. Um, and saves an extra bit fake, basically. Um, and so you can also do dependencies between them with this somewhat elaborate syntax. Um, MC depends is the uh, var flag that sort of defines this. Um, if you look at the documentation, basically, it gives some examples. Um, but one thing that is also key to remember is the multi-configs can't reference variables from each other because they're separate bit bake instances. Um, and this gets into if you're trying to use bits from each other, you have to be careful um, because you can't see the value of the deployer from the other guy. Um, but if you have anything that's in local.conf before the multi-config line is visible in both builds. So this is one way to work around that that I'll show if I get, get through all the slides. Um, so how is this sort of useful for containers? So we, you know, we, we've been showing and what Bruce described is you build an image and you, you know, with Docker import it, or maybe you build an LXC you know, image uh, or take, take an image and import it into one of the tools. And then on your target, you know, either in your cloud setup or on an embedded target, you would fetch those images down. Um, one of the options here is we could actually want to have a turnkey build where we can bit bake an image and put it on a target, and we want to have containers in it already. This is something we could do with multi-config. Um, there are issues around the tooling because it is hard to do some of the processing of, of a, you know, a container image to get it into something that looks like an on-disk, on-target sort of file system. Um, run C and system D and spawn are not too bad. Um, I haven't actually gotten the run C, all the, the JSON stuff has to do it myself, but it looks reasonable. Um, but other things you would probably have to use a post install script. So. If you wanted to deploy a system that you had built with OE and have it automatically boot up and have containers in it, you would, you know, the straightforward thing with Docker is that you would have like a an init script that would basically go to Docker and 
do like your one time install and then, or you use Kubernetes, right? You go full bore into the whole cloud native world. Um, so if we did want to do this sort of, uh, sort of contained together nested build, um, there's an example here. The other thing that's recently come up and I thought I had put it on the slide here is, um, in the EGL world now, actually, we, there was a demo that was shown at, a, at CES where they're booting up and they run the uh, infotainment and the cluster as two different containers. And their process to assemble that is very painful They because they they're building three different, basically, root file systems separately. <laughs> and, and then they actually have to partition their SD card and boot up the host and basically install the container images for those two things separately. That's the kind of thing we can hopefully do at some point with with uh, Bitbake would just do it. Um, but even if we don't have the whole SD, you know, the WIC all worked out to do the whole thing in one shot, being able to build all three of those things at once, we could have you know the host and cluster and infotainment as three multi-configs and just build it, um, which is, something we might think about how to do for AGL. Um, should I keep going? <laughs> uh, so this is the example. Uh, so basically I, I reused my uh, my distro conf I showed earlier as the container. So that's Alpine-ish with muscle. Um, and then I do the same thing with, I want to build a light HTTP container. And this is where we get into the multi-config dependencies. So, the hack here is in local.comp, I actually make a variable to say what the tempter for the uh, multi-config will be so that I can later reference it. Because otherwise I would have to hard code paths to know where to go get the bits from the other build. So this is kind of, you're trying to do these things and I think folks are going to do FPGAs and stuff like that. They're going to have to have something like this or else you're going to have to have a whole bunch of other coded paths, which is a bit fragile. Because you might have to say, go up five directories and then back down, and you'd have to hard code the machine type and stuff like that. Because there is sensitivity here. Uh, last night I was trying to be clever and rename my <laughs> rename my distro uh, config and the, uh, the multi-config name. But the thing is, is it's actually, for these types of things, you're actually embedding that in the recipe. So I could actually put this as a variable, I guess, as well. But if you say I want to rename the multi-config to like food-container, then the dependency actually has to be changed in the recipes. So there's a little bit of tweakiness for this type of stuff still. But you can see I'm basing off of that container tempter uh, variable to be able to grab the light HTTP bits from the other build. Yes, yeah. Uh, I just want to change the spelling of multi-config there, because I think it tends to... It, well, yes. Uh, it still works as multi-config, as far as I know. Um, but in the... I think you could use MC now. I, I was working on these last night, and I forgot to double-check, because I did have that same thought about whether MC works in this context. On the command line, it definitely does. But in the dependency uh, definition, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to go look it up. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, and this is how we would uh, kind of continue. We, I go and do a do install and grab the bits and put them in a, a, a actually build a package for the host machine that's got the container bits from the multi config in it. So an FPGA is very similar if you were interested in that type of stuff. So here's our host machine distro config. And here's my uh, system D unit to basically start it up. So, and then I just basically pull that in in a, a sort of very simple container host. Um, so there's still some refactoring. If you were, if I was going to productize this, I would redo some stuff and kind of maybe make some classes to, to do it in a bigger way. Um, and if I you really were going to do sandboxing effectively, you'd have to actually do fancier stuff in your system D and spawn to kind of actually do some more name, name spacing. Um, and like, like I said, the OCI images, there's still a bit there. I think the Oryx, they've got it solved and maybe oversee, but there's not nothing that's very straightforward reusable that I've seen so far to just take the OCI image and do the bundle JSON stuff. Uh, Cause every time I look at it, my head explodes, but 
because um, it's there's like a, a bajillion options in the JSON. <laughs> um, but one of the other things is you can actually boot an OCI image directly with systemd now. Um, I've not tried it recently, but it, in Zeus and Master that should be doable. Um, and like I said, you have to get the, the, bu the bundle in the right format with the config.json. Um, so that's everything. Um, not too bad, I guess. <laughs> um, and so here's some resources. And these uh, little demo snippets I have in a, uh, a little layer. I'm going to push an update to it. I tweaked a couple things actually yesterday. So, uh, But there's also a, a full video of what I gave in Edinburgh. This is a bit more uh, advanced. Um, I don't. There's other ways that to do uh, simpler types of nesting without actually using multi-config, but at this point it doesn't seem as useful. This is way more flexible. Um, and even without doing nesting, like I said, if you were going to build a bunch of containers, and say you're doing uh, per app containers and you want to build like a bunch of them, having a multi-config or potentially for your, if you're building a host machine and the containers would be useful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's the future. <laughs> and uh, are we good for questions or should I just wrap it up? And Do you have any quick questions? I mean, we'll have time at lunch to talk to someone yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you.